introduce Sean. He doesn't really need any introduction. I'm sure you guys all know who he is. He's a growth expert. He's a founder and CEO of growthhackers.com. He's also the founder and CEO of uh, Insights Product Qualaroo. Um, and before that, he got made a lot of uh, people like know him because he helped Dropbox, Eventbrite, Zobni, and a lot of other companies uh, basically grow like crazy and be very successful. He does have a book, as I mentioned. It's an e-book called Startup Growth Engines. It's very popular. That's his Twitter handle. And he's going to talk to what I love about Sean. He's, he had a startup pyramid for a long time ago, and he developed that product market fit question, uh, which is a great quantitative, you know, empirical way to assess product market fit, is that he's a marketer, but he's a marketer who appreciates the importance of product and that they're not distinct and they're really related. And the, the importance of that overlap has just gone gotten bigger over time. So that's what he's going to be talking about today. So without further ado, let me introduce Sean. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. So, what you get set? Uh, oh, nice and fast switch over. Hey, everyone. So, uh, it's great to be here tonight, and uh, I uh, am good to know what the mix of everybody is here because I came in with a set of assumptions, and uh, so I'm going to have to change my slides real quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, fortunately, uh, fortunately for like a third of you, it'll be perfect, and <laughs> everyone else just yeah, bear with it. But. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, like uh, obviously, whatever your role is, um, we all want to have explosive growth with with the products that we're responsible for building, for uh, marketing, for whatever whatever the role is. Of, if you're an entrepreneur, as a, as a founder, you you want to grow your business, and um, and unfortunately, uh, it's gotten a lot harder. So um, this little uh, trough down there is uh, is what. Uh, Essentially, the number of dollars per person online uh, in the United States when I first started marketing uh, logged me in about uh, 12 years ago. And uh, during that period of time, uh, the, the dollars per person online uh, in terms of ad dollars has increased about 3.5x. And so it's, it's just a lot more money chasing uh, the same amount of attention. And so on that side, it's gotten harder. And then obviously, the channels through which you reach people um, are in constant flux, and so uh, growth, unfortunately, has gotten a lot harder over the last uh, over the last few years. Um, and uh, and so, what I'm going to talk about tonight is basically the requirements that you need to get right to be able to effectively grow today. And uh, some of them won't be a surprise. Like the first one, you need to be able to leverage product market fit. Anytime you've got lean in a in a meetup group, you've all heard product market fit. It's almost become a cliche. But um, it's so important that we're going we're gonna to talk a bit about that. And then uh, you also need to have a very clear North Star metric that um, defines what growth means for your organization. And uh, we'll talk about how to figure out what your North Star metric is and, uh, and what you do with that. Um, and to really be effective with growth, you need to mobilize not just you know, a small group of marketers or even marketing and product. You actually need to, to mobilize everyone across the company and, and have everyone across the company understand what their role is in driving growth and, uh, and coordinate that. So we'll talk about that piece. And then finally, uh, you need a high tempo testing process. You need to constantly be in testing mode uh, to figure out how to grow the business. So let's start with um, product market fit. Um, basically. As I said, it's, it's somewhat cliche, but I mean, the most important thing from a growth perspective to think about with, with product market fit is that it is impossible to sustainably grow if you don't have product market fit. You can, uh, you can gain things for a little while, and you might be able to uh, have some numbers that look good on a chart, but um, if, if people don't ultimately want what you've built, then uh, they're not going to stick around. And so, um, so in terms of actually validating product market fit, uh, Dan talked about the, the one question that I use, which is uh, really a leading indicator of product market fit, which is just asking users, how, how would they feel if they couldn't use your product anymore? And um, you're not looking for the people who say they would be somewhat disappointed. Um, you know, it's, I hear from a lot of companies that, uh, oh, yeah, like 80% of the people said they would be somewhat disappointed without our product. <laughs> there's a lot of choices out there. That is not, there's not enough user passion to build a real business off of. So what you're, what you're looking for is the people who say they'd be very disappointed without your product. And what I found, I've, I've, I've run this question across probably a thousand different companies at this point. Um, I, I published it on survey.io and uh, worked with a lot of different companies and looking at the results. And 
when companies get around 40% of their users saying that they'd be very disappointed without the product, those companies tend to do pretty well. And, and companies that uh, have, have significantly, significantly less than that tend to really struggle with growth. And the good news is that um, even if you don't have 40% overall, if you start to segment the data, so uh, among college students, we have 40%, or among professionals, we have 40%, or among women, we have 40%. You just, you need, you need uh, within a segment to have enough user passion, uh, and then you can focus on that segment and, uh, and start to, to actually uh, know that you've, you've got at least signals of product market fit. Obviously, what people do is more important than what they say, and so the lagging indicator of product market fit is retention cohorts, and um, people keep using the product. That's, that's a sign that, you've, that you're doing something right. So starting point, if, if you recall, the, the four requirements were, the first one was leveraging product market fit. So it's not just having it, but it's actually leveraging it. So first, you have to validate it, then you have to understand it. So um, understanding it comes down to, um, when you ask that question, how would you feel if you could no longer use our product? Uh, those people who say they'd be very disappointed really hold the keys to being able to really um, unlock organic growth within your business. And so um, we'll, we'll talk about first these questions and then, and then ultimately what you do with the answers to these questions. But um, the, the kind of key questions are an intent question. Why did you seek this product in the first place? So you want to, again, you're only looking at the people who say they'd be very disappointed without the product. And you want to learn what, what was it that made them actually consider the product. They couldn't, they couldn't decide that they'd be very disappointed without it until they actually made the decision to try it. And so what, what was it about them that caused them to try it in the first place? Um, how, uh, how are they actually using the product? Are they, are, they, uh, are they using it in the way that you intended? Or are, are, they, are they actually using it in ways that maybe you didn't intend? And so um, that's really important. And then... I really like this one. I, I ask people how, how uh, if, if they've recommended the product, but then if they have, I ask them how they would describe it when they recommend it. And um, it's interesting because I, I used to work with a bunch of early stage companies. And um, when I asked the CEO what they do, I was, I was more confused than before I asked the CEO what they do. And I'm guilty of that as well. Because um, you just get so deep in it and you, you have a bunch of assumptions and you can't sort between what, what, what are your assumptions and what are the realities. But if I read five answers of people who would recommend the product, who write how they describe it when they recommend it, oh, okay, that's what they do. And so there's, there's really some, some good value in that. And then, uh, and then the, the last piece that you're looking for is the, um, is the actual the key benefit that people get from the product. So it's not just about sort of, the what it's it's kind of the why and um i i have a process where i where i start basically as a as a kind of crowdsourcing process to figure out the key benefit just an open-ended question initially ask people um what what is the primary benefit that you get from this product and get a bunch of write-ins so there's no no uh i'm not i'm not leading them at all but when i start to see recurring themes in those write-ins I start to break those out into an actual statement that, that reflects those themes. And once I got sort of three or four distinct statements, then I do a follow-on survey to a different group of people where I say, which is the best benefit, the you know, best statement that reflects the benefit of, of, that you get from this product? And they pick from the multiple choice. And then I have an open-ended question afterwards that says, why is that important to you? And there's, there's gold in the why is that important to you. But um, you, you really start to be able to then filter down. People who pick this, what percentage of those people would be very disappointed without the product? And you, you, what you start to find is that um, you got to balance kind of strategically between um, maybe a whole bunch of people are picking one, but the passion level is pretty low. And then much fewer are picking another, but those all of those people say they can't live without the product. And then you, you maybe say, you know, it's, it's not as big of a market opportunity if I really position on this, but that's going to give me more passionate users. And so sometimes there's a trade-off. The best is when they're actually the same, the one that's really popular and, and the one that uh, brings in passionate users. But uh, this information is kind of key to, to ultimately unlocking the organic growth within the business. And so that's, that's the, the last point around product market fit is actually leveraging the product market fit to grow the business. So um, you know, one of the best things that you can do for retention is actually in your onboarding and in your initial expectation setting about the product. If you, if you put a promise out there about what the product's gonna do for people, 
and the product doesn't actually deliver on that promise, but it's super compelling to people, you might get a lot of people signing up and even paying for it, but um, if it's a SaaS business, they're going to churn out pretty quickly if, if the product doesn't deliver on that promise. So you want a promise that actually is really authentic about what the product actually does and does well. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of this, this promise statement. And then ultimately, um, the, you know, we talked about there's a three and a half increase in the number of dollars chasing attention of each user online. And so trying to get a message into people's head is really hard when every other message is going in there. The average person seeing 3,000 advertisements a day, it's really hard to break through. So if somebody actually has intent that's related to your product, you want to talk to that intent. You want to, that, that intent is, is a pathway into reaching that person and connecting with that person. And so if you can get the right hook, so that's where you probably do a lot of A-B testing. Maybe intent might change a bit by, by the channel through which you're acquiring somebody, but um, you want to really get the best response rate on the intent side and then layer in a promise that is contextually relevant to that intent. So there's a little bit of art in figuring out how to, how to have those two things connect together. And uh, so you're A-B testing broadly on the first part. The second part, you're really constrained around, um, around what is an authentic promise about what makes that product a must have. And then you still need a pretty clear description about what the heck the product actually is. And so that's, that's nice to be able to crowdsource that from the how people describe it when they recommend the product. So that messaging can drive a lot of momentum of bringing people into the site. And then the goal is ultimately to, to get them into that must have experience, get them to, to that point where they say, oh my God, I can't live without this. And um, so yeah, set the, set the right expectations, drive that momentum, reduce friction along the way, drive them to that must have experience. And that's really what it takes to start to unlock that organic growth. So we really haven't talked about testing external channels or anything else. It's, it's more about whatever traffic is coming to your site initially, setting the right expectation and driving that momentum toward the must have experience is really important for unlocking organic growth. Now we're gonna talk about actually driving growth, proactively driving growth. And that starts with understanding what your North Star metric is. And so um, a North Star metric, um, is uh, it's really it's it's tightly correlated to the value that someone's getting with your from from your product. So um, you, if if you're let's let's say you, you're, you're, the key metric you're trying to optimize your business on is registrations. Does anyone get any value when they register for a product? Probably not. It's just it's that's uh, you know a vanity metric. Uh, to, so it might look great, but they're they're not having an experience with the registration. So. Um, a couple of examples of, of actually value being delivered would be Airbnb with their nights booked, Uber with rides delivered, even Facebook, you know, more simple monthly active users. Uh, a lot of SaaS businesses would be uh, monthly recurring revenue. So it's, that revenue is generally, if it's recurring, it's because they haven't canceled, it's because they're getting value from it. So it's, it's just essentially something that you can uh, make some, some key decisions on. So, um, once you have a North Star metric, then you have to think about what are the, what are the submetrics that lead up to that North Star metric. So a pretty simple model um, for, for MRR looks something like this. So new users plus retained users plus revenue per user, and you're trying to expand that revenue per user, but each, each of those together add up to MRR. And, um, and so you're understanding ultimately uh, each of those sub pieces, but, but at the end of the day, everything is being looked at from, from the perspective of how does that impact your North Star metric. And so um, that's really, it becomes the lens through which you evaluate everything that you're doing from a growth perspective. If, it, if, if you can't make the case that it's impacting your North Star metric, then you probably shouldn't do it. And if it's really important and you can't make the case, maybe you need to rethink what your North Star metric is. But uh, that's, North Star metric is, is ultimately how you're going to be able to track uh, how are you gonna be able to track growth and track what impacts growth? So the third piece on the requirements for growth today is, a, um, is full company participation. And so whether people want to be working on growth or not, pretty much everybody across your company is impacting growth. And so someone in support who's not doing a good job is gonna probably make you, you not able to retain users very well or 
not be able to get users active on the product. Um, the product team holds, holds probably the biggest levers when it comes to growth. Um, marketing, of course, is focused on a lot of customer acquisition, but, but basically the, the R framework that Dave McClure uh, came up with is, is really, is really where, what drives growth. So most people historically have kind of just thought like marketing or sales, just the external acquisition side of things was what drove growth. But as we talked about the kind of growth accounting framework, it's... It's a series of things that, that ultimately lead to moving your North Star metric. And most of those levers fall in different organizations across the company. And so whether people are you know, specifically evaluating their activities around its impact on growth or not, they're impacting it. What a growth team is doing is really trying to coordinate those efforts and bring a more scientific approach to, uh, to, to understanding how each person within the organization can move the needle on growth and, uh, and uh, prioritize uh, actions across different groups when it comes to growth. So um, how, how many people here have actually a, a growth team within your companies now? Okay, cool. So, I mean, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely something that's... Um, so the, the, that was maybe, I would say, uh, about 10 at tops, 20% of the people in here. So it, it is still relatively new. Um, and Facebook pioneered this idea of, of a growth team. And, um, but interestingly, like Harvard Business Review just wrote uh, an article uh, on the growth manager. And um, that was based on a longer study that's being taught at Harvard Business School now on, on the growth manager and the growth role and cross-functional growth coordination. And so I think we're still seeing really on the front end of things, but with the fastest growing companies in the world have a growth team and have a growth organization and, and a very uh, systematic process of, of driving growth within those businesses. So Facebook, LinkedIn, Uber, I was at Uber a couple of nights ago and hearing the breakdown and, and I was on a panel with people from uh, Airbnb, Pinterest, Slack, and um, it, it's, it's interesting, they are, they're all using an approach that 10 years ago um, really nobody was using and, uh, and today the fastest growing companies are, are doing that and so that's what we'll, we'll talk about in the next, uh, next few slides here. And so that approach is really driven by a growth team and um, I think a lot of times people think growth team, okay, I gotta, I gotta sketch out what, what does my growth team need to look like? What, how do I go out and hire these people? Maybe in nine months we can, we can actually start doing something with these people, but let's, let's kind of build it out. And the good news is you don't need to wait that long. Uh, a single person can really kind of kick off that growth team. You can, you can have a cross-functional growth effort. Um, as long as you have you know, a PM of growth or a growth master or growth manager, whatever you wanna call it, um, having somebody who's managing the growth process and, um, and ultimately trying to execute testing at a high tempo, hitting a testing goal. And if that testing goal is not being hit because every time you have an experiment that you're trying to launch, you can't get design resources to get that experiment out, then maybe you need a dedicated designer on the team. So basically building the team to fill the bottlenecks, but initially trying to actually work with different people across different departments is gonna get you moving uh, faster toward, toward running testing at a, at a high tempo than, uh, and I'll talk about why that's important in a minute, uh, that the testing at a high tempo, but, um, but just looking at it through the lens of, that's, the growth team is ultimately just trying to manage that testing process and trying to run, run better tests. Um, and uh, so core growth teams eventually tend to include uh, you know, designers, growth engineers, analysts, product people, marketing people, copywriters. It, 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 there's, there's a lot of different uh, functions that can, can ultimately make up a, a growth team. And again, their, their objective is to execute uh, high tempo testing, execute process around high tempo testing. And so that's what we're gonna talk about as the last area. And so um, ultimately it's testing that drives growth. So well, testing drives growth, part of it, first part is that organic part. A great product does actually drive growth when that great product is positioned the right way and the friction is pulled out of the onboarding, you are gonna get some level of organic growth, but accelerating that organic growth and really reaching the potential of that business requires testing. And that testing, um, the main reason you're running that testing, you can't, I mean, say the, the number of startups that have not actually even launched yet, but they, in their pitch deck, have a, uh, have a marketing plan. 
How, how do you know what you're supposed to do or not? What you have is a marketing hypothesis maybe of how, how you're gonna grow the business. So day one, you have no idea what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. And the only way to figure out what's gonna work or not work is to, is to test things. And the more testing you do, the more learning you get. And that learning helps you understand, okay, there's growth opportunities here. Let's do more of that. Let's double down in that area. This area didn't work. Why didn't that area work? But you learn from that, and uh, and ultimately some of the some of the um, tests that I've done that uh, didn't work. Once I figured out why they didn't work, they led to to kind of breakthrough learning on a different test that worked really well. And so you know, trying to understand why things work and why they don't work um, is is ultimately what what leads to that learning. And you're and you're testing across all of these levers. So acquisition all the way down to retention and uh, resurrection of users. So this is an example. Everybody knows that Twitter has had some growth problems recently. Anyone from Twitter here? OK, good. <laughs> um, so uh, interestingly, it's not the first time Twitter's had growth problems. In 2010, at the, uh, the last two quarters, they were almost completely flat. It actually, you can't really see it that well because it's under the red, uh, red line there. But those last two quarters, there was almost no growth there. and at that point, they brought in a new uh, uh, product manager, VP product, who turned up their testing from about one test every two weeks to 10 tests per week. And you can see that they had very consistent quarter over quarter growth by just cranking that testing up. And I did the same thing in my company when we didn't have, we, we went through a flat period. As soon as we turned that testing way up, we saw a lot of growth. And I've, I've talked to a, a ton of companies who've, who've, who've done the same thing. Most people aren't sharing the exact numbers around the number of tests they're running and the results that correlate with that. But uh, fortunately, Twitter, Twitter's unique user numbers are public. And so when I saw this, uh, this presentation by the, the former VP of product, um, I was able to uh, just layer the two on top of each other and, and see what happened. There's a question there? Yeah, so we'll, we'll go through that. Like, I mean, a red versus blue is a lot harder to uh, the, a lot harder to kind of have a clear hypothesis on why red, why blue. Um, so most of the tests that I'm I'm running are, uh, and I'll, I'll actually include some examples of some tests that I'm running that um, are are a little bit more targeted to targeted to to you know wh whether they're external channel tests or I'll give you one example. Um, when I was at Log Me In, we had. Uh, we had one channel that we turned on that sent 200,000 new people a day to the website and a 10% conversion rate to sign up. And um, so we had 20,000 people a day signing up. And then at the download step, we had a, a 90 plus percent drop off rate. And um, we started running a bunch of tests at that level to, to try to figure out, you know, how do, how do we get that 90% up and, and make that a viable channel? And when we probably ran 20, 25 tests with almost no movement. Um, and then we actually decided, fortunately they, they had registered, so we decided we're gonna actually ask them, why did you register and not download the software? And the, uh, the feedback that we got from a ton of people was that they, they actually didn't believe that the product was free. And at the time, Blogmean had a free version. And so um, that, that insight, the next test that we ran tripled our download rate at that step, and the next test was actually um, having two choices at the download step. Download the free version or download a trial of the paid version. And we big check mark and download the free version. And so, so it's, you know, it's not just random testing, but it's about sort of diagnosing what the problem is and running a test against that. And, then, and that's why often like a button color test is not going to is, is not gonna be extreme enough to be able to get any kind of read anyway. Like you'd, you'd have to run it for so long that, it's, uh, th that you're not gonna see the result on it. So um, the, you know, once you start running tests at a high volume, then you need to be very process oriented. Otherwise, you, you know, if you imagine Twitter running 10 tests per week. After 10 weeks, how do you remember what tests you ran or didn't run? And you know, it starts to get pretty messy. And so you need to be, you need to really have good documentation and a good process for executing those tests. And that's what this is. So um, first you need a, to, to have really unbridled ideation. So um, 
have a lot of, you know, build a really big backlog of ideas. And if you have a really big backlog of ideas, then you need a good process for prioritizing those ideas. Um, otherwise, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it gets messy on figuring out which tests to run. Um, and then you need to actually launch the tests and decide through that prioritization process which tests are actually going to be launched and manage the launch of those tests. And then, uh, and then finally capture the learning from those tests. So we'll go through each of these individually. So um, unbridled ideation, again, this is, this is where you want to start drawing in ideas from across the organization. So my company, we have, we have over 700 ideas in our backlog um, of things that we haven't yet tested. Um, and those ideas have primarily come from yeah, ev everyone internally within the company. But when, when there's a new platform, let's say um, you know, we want to try to figure out how to use Pinterest to grow and maybe no one within the company has ever grown anything on Pinterest before, then, then we, wanna, we wanna actually get uh, help from somebody externally who might have, that, have those insights. And so as you're, as you're building up a backlog of test ideas, you definitely wanna mine everybody internally. You know, support people are gonna have a lot of insights around uh, where people might be getting uh, caught up on activating in the product and some of the initial onboarding challenges. Um, Engineers a lot of times are gonna, gonna be able to provide test ideas that are um, based on knowledge of what's technically possible where other people wouldn't even be able to come up with those ideas. So the more that you can get a lot of people involved in the process, the, the easier it is to build a big backlog of ideas. And then you need a, a, a really good way of prioritizing those ideas. So um, this is where uh, mo most of the companies that are using a good growth process have this idea of an experiment doc. And within that experiment doc, there's uh, specific information ranging from uh, any of the data that supports why this seems to be um, a needed experiment. Like so in the case that I told you earlier, uh, we have a 90% drop off rate here. That seems way higher than it should be at that, that one step. So that would be some of the, the data. And then there might be more data that says a survey has revealed that people are dropping off because they don't believe that the product's actually free. So any of that data you want to include with the experiment. And then uh, you want to be clear about what your hypothesis is. I think when we run this test that this will happen. And, um, and hopefully you can then connect that. I think this positive thing will happen that is very clear on how that, that ties to your North Star metric. If it's not, then you know, maybe is not... Uh, is not going to be an important test, and then target lever. So where is is it? You know, where in the funnel does it actually sit? Um, and then uh, so we use something called an ice score as well. So um, each test we're we're looking at on a scale of one to ten. Uh, what do we think the potential impact? So I in ice is impact. Um, if if this thing works really well, uh, I if this this. If this works, it could be a game changer. We would, we would give it a 10. If this works, it might not move the needle that much, but, um, but we think it'll work. So that's what the next part is, is, is C is confidence. So what is, what is the confidence score? If somebody isn't gonna move the needle very much, but you're really confident it's gonna work and it's really easy to do, why not do it? And so that's confidence. And then the last part is ease. So the best tests are gonna score well on, uh, you know, it's really high impact potential. You got a lot of data that says, and a lot of research that says, this thing is probably gonna work. And so you got a high confidence score. It's really easy to do. So if you got tens across the board, that'd be a really good test to run. And, uh, and the benefit once you've scored the tests on ICE is that you can start to, you start to look at them linearly and you can say, okay, what's the, what's the highest scoring, you know, the average of those, what are the highest scoring tests? Um, if you're really focused around, uh, say, retention, then you can narrow down to tests that are just around retention. And so a lot of people are doing this in spreadsheets. Like there's, there's a lot of different ways you could do it. But once you've got the information kind of standardized that way, it becomes a lot easier to, to narrow down to the, uh, to, the, to the tests in the focus areas that you're, that you're focused on. That's uh, ah. all right. <laughs> Um, that's, it's in private beta right now, but it's uh, called Growth Hackers Projects. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, you can use spreadsheets, you can use, uh, there, there's a lot of different things that you can, you can do for this. It's really the process that, that, that matters here. And so that's, that's kind of the key, key focus. And so then once you've selected, uh, once you've kind of said, okay, these are the high priority tests to run, 
then, uh, then you actually want to go and launch those tests. And so for us, um, we, we have a weekly growth meeting. So what a, what a lot of people are doing with growth is, is just like a product sprint. They're doing a growth sprint. So it's a, it's a weekly meeting where they're planning the growth sprint. They're selecting what are they going to do that week, some discussion, and then it's being assigned to a project manager. And so I'll show you on the next slide what our agenda and our weekly growth meeting looks like. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, so we're choosing test the launch. We actually have something where each person on the growth team, and the growth team includes like core growth team members, our head of product, our head of engineering, um, me as CEO. So pe people kind of across, across the company are, are, are uh, head of design, um, are participating here, nominating, we're trying to nominate a couple of tests each. And then, and then when we get together, we're deciding which of those nominated, we're doing like a little 30 second pitch on why we think this is a good test to run that week. Um, and then once we select a test, assign it to a project manager, and then uh, the product manager of growth is, uh, or, or yeah, project managers, and the product manager of growth is assisting in the release of that test. So if, uh, if you can't get the design resources or you can't get something, they're helping to, uh, helping to actually coordinate to, to, to help you get that test out. And so our uh, growth meeting agenda starts with like a, a, a KPI, uh, time where we're just studying like what are the, what are the key performance indicators? How how is our North Star metric trending? Where do we see the opportunities for growth? Um, just a, 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 a general discussion around um, some of some of the key metrics in the business, and then a review of the previous week's testing sprint. Here's the four tests we wanted to get out last week. Did we get them all out, or did one of them not go out? Why did it not go out? Trying to figure out where the bottlenecks are in the system, and then uh, key lessons learned. So this is the, probably the most important part. For those tests that were completed, so some tests might take three or four weeks to complete once they come out. Um, once there's a statistically significant sample size, whether it is a successful or unsuccessful test in terms of uh, moving the metric that they're trying to move, does uh, you know wh what were the key lessons there? And a big discussion around kind of those key lessons learned, and that's again the reason that we're we're doing this is for that learning. And then uh, then we're selecting the tests that we're going to run in the next week's sprint. And again, that's where everybody who's nominated a couple of ideas each has pitched those ideas. Then as a group, we're going through. And what we find sometimes is if we were not as a group trying to pick those tests, we might say, you know, we might forget that somebody's, you know, that, that a resource is not available to help with the release of that test or somebody's already overwhelmed or we're already running a test at that point in the funnel and it's going to conflict with the other tests. So it's, it's good as a group to be able to, to run through that. And then, uh, and then finally, we're just looking to make sure that the backlog of ideas is continuing to grow. And generally, our backlog is growing at three or four x the rate of what we're actually able to test each week. Um, and I'm almost done. So then we can open up for conversation and questions around this. So, um, and then the last part is uh, capture the learning and, and making that learning available to everyone across the company. So. You can't expect people to participate in the growth process with ideas if they don't have full transparency into what's worked and what didn't work. And so you really need to make that available. Um, companies like TripAdvisor actually have like a, a weekly wins email that they send out. Um, some people just have like, uh, I mean, a lot of people have sort of a weekly message that they're sending out about how, what's, what's moved on their, um, on their kind of key, key metrics and what are the key things that were released. And, um, but uh, ultimately you wanna make all of that information available for people. And so, uh, and you, you just yeah. So it's you want to make sure that you're um, that you're capturing that learning and, and making that learning available, and that you're sharing it back. Um, big arrow pointing to the internal people because you, you want full transparency. But if you actually work with somebody externally, it's great to close the loop and and let them uh, know what has been working and you know did did that thing they come up with work. So for example, um, Tammy Camp, one of the advisors. At, uh, at 500 Startups, looked at our emails and she said that we weren't using DKIM in our emails and that we could improve our, our open rate with that. And I said, great, you know, here's, here's an experiment doc. Fill it out. This, this would be great and I'll let you know how it worked. And her prediction was it would increase our open rate by 10%, actually increased it by 12.5%. And so she got that feedback. And, uh, and you know, part of her reward for helping us was to actually you know, learn from, from that, um, the impact of it. So just a couple of, uh, a couple of test examples that we've run recently. 
Um, one was, you know, a lot of people have seen this kind of to-do list uh, that, that Cora uses. Um, we, we had uh, data basically telling us that most people, so growthhackers.com is, uh, if you haven't used it before, it's like Reddit, where um, it's a community around articles, but these are mostly growth articles. And what we're, you know, if, if there's not a discussion around the growth articles, then it's really just discovery and, and going somewhere else. So it's really important for us to drive discussion. And the more discussion that we drive, the more that we, um, the more likely people are to keep using it over, over the long run. So um, we had a pretty low percentage of people who were not, uh, pretty low percentage of people who were commenting on the first week when they came into the site. And so our hypothesis was if we gave them a list of, of things that they should be doing, like you, you've seen it on LinkedIn, you've seen it on Quora, and that if we start with some of the things that are really easy to do, like vote on an article or something that doesn't require a lot of consideration, then over time that, that some of the harder things, they'll see that they haven't done them yet and that hopefully that will impact and, and increase the number of uh, people who are doing those things. And so um, we actually got a 700% increase in uh, first week commenting by, by using this approach. And uh, so it's, you know, lots of tests don't work out, but this was one that we did within the last month that worked out really well. Another idea that we had recently, um, this, was, this was probably a, like a year ago, but um, we found that embedded media on the site like slide shares or, uh, or videos naturally led to longer sessions. So unlike an article where you're clicking off to read it, those, you know, YouTube and SlideShare was designed to bring that media on, onto the other site. And so, um, but we were finding that uh, we had to spot that it was clicking off somewhere else and in admin set those things up. And once we laid out, like the data shows this is great, but we're missing a lot of this. It was it, just showing that to an engineer. The engineer said, we can use this thing called OEmbed. And the, anytime someone submits a, SlideShare link or a YouTube link or even image links is going to it's going to pull it directly in there and it doesn't require uh, it doesn't require the user or an admin to do anything and so um, we were able to get a, a forty percent increase in the amount of embedded media so that would be an example of like a really high confidence score on that maybe maybe the E score might be a little lower but the confidence score is same action is going to lead to yeah, a, a, a more engaging experience. And so that worked out really well for us. So that's kind of the high level on things. I'll just you know, review one more time that uh, growth is really tough. And um, if, you're not, if you don't have product market fit, don't try to grow. That, that part a lot of people have talked about, but very few people have talked about actually how, how can you really leverage product market fit to drive organic growth. And so that's what we went through is leveraging um, product market fit to drive that organic growth. Um, importance of, of having a clear, clearly defined North Star metric and something that's communicated to everyone across the organization. So people aren't kind of just, just working on a metric that they think is important to their silo, but they understand how it, how it feeds up to the metric that should be driving everybody's decision making across the company. Full company participation. Everybody affects growth, whether they know it or not. Help them understand how they affect growth, coordinate those efforts, and by running weekly growth sprints where you're tapping into the creative insights of everyone across the organization and assigning out tasks and experiments that they can be running, um, you as an organization become a much better learning organization. And ultimately, it's about testing. You don't know what's going to work, what's not going to work. You need to test at that high tempo, and, uh, and you need to be super systematic about it, or the wheels fall off on the testing. So. Um, that's it, and hopefully we've got, got some time for some questions. Yeah, we definitely do. So um, thanks a lot, Sean. That was a great talk. Welcome. Um, a lot of great material in a short amount of time here. So we do have two mics running around, me and Jonathan here. So just raise your hand and wait till you get a mic, and then we'll give it to one person. Just be mindful if there's someone ahead of you or not. So all right. Anybody else got a question? Thanks. Hi. Uh, I had a question on your sprint pl planning slide that you had uh -huh. uh, around the, the growth stuff. So do you, is there, is there a continually, continually growing body of tests that you're running or are you expiring them along the way? Is, there, is it a mix of certain tests that you want to run and continue to monitor? I'm just wondering like yeah, how that so body of tests grows or shrinks or what happens. So it, 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 the, the number of simultaneous tests running tend, tends to, uh, 
tends to actually grow because we're releasing new tests every week, but a lot of them take a few weeks to, to get a big enough sample size on. And so, um, and, but, but at any given point, we're probably not running more than like 10 or 15 tests. And as long as there's enough sort of external channel tests, then they're not gonna be conflicting with each other. It's when, when you're running multiple tests on the same page or the same, the same step within the funnel, things get a little dicey. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that clears that up. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question was, uh, how how long do you run a test to figure out whether I mean is that enough time for a test to be in in the wild to get enough feedback and figure out whether it works or not? Mm -hmm. And how do you not fi like how do you figure out that maybe it was that you put it out there and people found it and were excited about it and it's because of that and not that the experiment is successful so that. Like, I think they're both related in a way. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting that you bring it up. So the, there's, there's kind of like some testing best practices, and one of them would be to always run tests across full week periods. So you don't want to run it like just from like, you, even if you have a statistically significant sample size and you can get there in three days, maybe it work, this version works best Monday through Wednesday, but that version is going to work best Thursday and Friday. So you always want to run it in like full week increments. And then otherwise it's, it's, it's a math problem to figure out the statistical significance on it. Um, the, but your other point is, uh, is do, you, do you get false wins just on the novelty factor? And there's a lot of discussion around that. And uh, I, 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 I look at it if, 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 I think that there is some of that, but that's even a better argument to run more tests then, because even if it's not, even if it's not a long-term win, if just testing a lot drives more interest in, in the activity, like of what's going on. But you, so as a result, what you need to do is continue to monitor afterwards if, if that result is continuing to, uh, d to be delivered and retest things over time. But, um, but you know, not everybody agrees with me that, uh, that, that, that's an opportunity if, if novelty is, is, a, uh, is, is something that gives you f false growth um, that, that, that I, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. So, but that's debatable. <laughs> Any question? Right yeah. Hi. Hey. I had a real deja vu feeling listening to your talk, and I haven't heard you speak before. Could you highlight any differences between, you know, when they talk about lean experiments and Build, measure, learn. I mean, what is it? The build, measure, learn loop and lean startup. Uh huh. It feels very similar. I think it is really similar, and so, um, and and we struggle with that a lot. So, um, you know, he kind of faded out on that. If people didn't hear the question, it's kind of like build, measure, learn of sort of just lean product development versus uh, hypothesis-driven uh, growth experimentation. Yeah, they're kind of the same thing, and and ultimately, maybe every product experiment should have a hypothesis that relates to growth. And if, that, if, if more engagement is an important growth metric, it's also an important product metric. So the way I've been reconciling that is I think about, um, I think about uh, the growth testing process is about maximizing against the current potential and the product testing process is about expanding that potential. It's, it's, about, it's about figuring out a new set of features that now brings in a, maybe a new market or, you know, that new set of features suddenly captures a bigger share of wallet. Um, but again, I think there's, there's a little bit of, uh, I mean, the good news is that, um, that it's not, this stuff isn't a perfect science. And so um, I think what holds a lot of people back is like, oh, I might be doing it wrong. <laughs> I think we're all doing it a little bit wrong. And that's, that's the, the beauty is that there's room for improvement. Yeah, that. Yeah, that, that essentially what what it, you're you're kind of uh, you're you're basically growing product market fit in some senses. You're 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 essentially you're essentially addressing new markets, or your product is is becoming uh, meaningful to to new market segments. And then the growth process and growth team is about making sure that that you're maximizing the potential against those, but. I'm kind of making that up and did over the last few weeks. So <laughs> maybe I'll don't, in a couple of weeks you might hear something different out of me. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
you mentioned that uh, ascertaining product market fit obviously is extremely important. And obviously trying to gain feedback from the users is obviously a big part of that. And so is it safe to assume that once you've reached a critical mass of users that sort of enough of a percentage of that users providing feedback will be statistically significant? Or do you have best practices to ensure that the feedback requests are actually, that you're actually getting the feedback that you need to actually ascertain product market fit? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so, so from a product market fit perspective, um, you know, especially like early on, you're, if you sort of say that product market fit is the gate that you have to clear before you focus on growth, then, then you're going to be dealing with a somewhat of a small sample size because otherwise you're trying to grow a sample size to find out that you don't have product market fit. So um, I, you know, you know I, I do think that you want to monitor it over time. And I, I saw like with Eventbrite that um, when I first started working with Eventbrite, the, um, the product market fit was... Uh, was really around convenience, people moving off of spreadsheets. And then over time, it, it, became, uh, it became actually a solution that helped people sell events out more because they had, they had really good hooks into Facebook and really like a, you know, affiliate type stuff there and even just event discovery on the platform. And so, you know, both of them, in both cases, people, people were really passionate about the solution and it was over 40%. But the reason that they were passionate about changed as because of the network effect business. So sort of the, the initial benefit was was based on sort of a single user experience of a, of a of an organizer and of an event. And then over time, as they got critical mass, a, a more valuable benefit came out of it. So um, so from the product market fit side, I think that's that's where the sample size piece comes in. From the sort of insights that drive smarter experiments. I don't really think about statistic, statistically significant sample size on the insights. What I'm looking for is, is, is directionally useful information to help me make better guesses about which experiments to run. So even, even in like one person saying I'm having a problem at this point, I don't need 3,000 people to say that they're, that they're having a problem at that point. Like I, I'm looking for the statistical significance on the experiment, but not on the feedback. Cool. Hey, um, so I had a question um, with the amount of tests that you run. So 10, 10 per sprint or uh -huh. so. Um, does that mean that essentially the company's philosophy has to be effort has to be low on these tests? Or the other side of that is how do you account for larger endeavors when you want to run a lot of tests? Yeah, so, so um, uh, early on, I think that uh, you should be very focused on. Um, so, we, so yeah, we didn't, we're not running ten per week. Our target is three per week. And in the beginning, if we're not hitting the three per week, it's because we're we're trying to do too big a test. And I think that bogs a lot of people down. I, I mean, one thing that I think if you if you actually ask most people to quickly tell you how many tests they've run in the last twelve months. And then you ask them to go afterwards and like actually document the exact tests that they run. I think most people would guess that they've run about twice as many tests as they actually have. Um, so, but, you know, a lot of people give lip service to testing that doesn't actually happen. And so, in that case, I would rather run smaller tests that are actually teaching me than bigger tests because I'm 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 trying to hit that home run with a test. And we have one test that uh, we. Our, the impact guess on the test was, I think, a five, and that that test in, increased our uh, our monthly email collection by 400%. But we and it was a really easy test. It was one that we could launch it with with like less than an hour of work in Optimizely, like like five minutes of work in Optimizely. We basically took an email collector that was sat at the bottom of the page and we moved it to the top of the page. And like we didn't think it was going to make that big of an impact, but but it did. And so that's part of it is you, you you don't. And then I've had other things that actually took a week to deploy, and then it then it turned out that they didn't even work. So like so so ultimately, what I would start with is a goal. Let's get three tests out a week, and if you're only getting two, do smaller and smaller until you get three. And then once you're getting three, then figure out how to run the best possible three you can and get, and get more aggressive about big tests. But um, 
Yeah, I think, I think holding yourself accountable to the number of tests is, I think, the easiest way to impact growth. Um, and it sounds super simplistic, but I actually <laughs> think it works. Uh, yeah. Hi, Sean. Hi. Fascinating topic. Uh, I got a question about the, uh, you mentioned it, the, it involved uh, intensive use of uh, testing process to drive growth, right? Have you ever seen any company or anybody that uh, um, combined with uh, statistical design of experiments? to design the test to make it more efficient. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the design of experiment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe not following you on that. My, my background is manufacturing. So in manufacturing, there's a technique called design of experiment where you have all variables. Each variable has many settings. And the, you have to run a lot of tests to cover all the possibilities, mm -hmm. right? So there's this technique called design of experiment that helps you Minimize the, the effort, I mean, optimize yeah. the effort, and still get a very good result. Yeah. Uh, now, applying to the software, I wonder if there's anybody who ever tried to you know, use that methodology. There, there's definitely automated multivariate testing systems that people have, have used. I think the challenge is that, um, as we've kind of talked about, statistically, statistically significant sample sizes is, is a challenge for a lot of companies. And... Then suddenly, now you break it down to, I've got 4,000 combinations. I, 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 I stopped trying multivariate testing a long time ago just because I could never, I could never get enough read on any one. But m maybe I just haven't uh, worked with a big enough sample size. If I was trying to grow Facebook, I probably would have enough people. But, uh, so I've seen it, but I, 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 uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're, what you're referring to there. Yeah. So you use this technique to design your test uh, so that you don't have to do you know, all the possibilities and just pick the, the right variables in the right settings. Yeah. And hopefully get the optimal result. Yeah, and I, and I think like, a, like on Facebook advertising, for example, I think some people are trying to do that because, again, you've got, you've got time slices, regional slices, different, like, different creatives. There's, there's so many different combinations. And because it's, it's on Facebook as a platform, you, have, you, you can get it in front of enough people to, to start to get a, a read a lot faster. But um, I think as you go deeper onto the site, that, that becomes a little bit harder, depending on the company. Another question? Um, I was wondering if your North Star point is actually dollars. How do you start doing the more risky tests in, in terms of pricing? If you triple your price and you're getting 10% more use, users or even 50% less users, you're ahead. And so how do, you, how do you kind of build that into your model? Because there's a lot of mo much more high risk scenarios when it's not just growing users when it becomes yeah. so a dollar I, side thing so i think dollars as a as a uh, north star metric pr probably like might work well in a charity like for for like dollars donated but um like one of the things when i was talking about with uh with north star metric it's it should be correlated to the value that customers are receiving and so um dollars dollars wouldn't necessarily be directly correlated like there's a, there to think of like inf infomercials where they're just hawking stuff that uh gets gets a good response rate i guess my question was more in relation to a SaaS service or product okay so like you, mr but for mrr would yeah that, would that work for your question well you, you could use mrr but you're getting the you're now you've cut your growth by uh, your growth got cut by half but you're making three times as much money because you tripled your price so mm -hmm. So I think that, like for MRR, that that's a that, that that's a great example and and something that I've actually done. I, I it's an example of like a, uh, a a test that I learned from a from a failed test where I actually went the other direction and said if I if 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 I make a really good free version of this product, we I, we did an acquisition of a product and the, and my my hypothesis on the acquisition. Talk about like an expensive test. We acquired the company and on a false hypothesis, but um, it was like let's acquire this. They're screwing up their freemium approach to this. Let's acquire it. We'll make the uh, the the free version of this product much better. It 
that free version, there's kind of a viral element to that that will spread it. And so we'll, we, may get, uh, we may get only like 4% of a growth curve that looks like this, but that's better than like 10% you know, monetization of a growth curve that looks like this in the, in the long run. And um, we did it, and all we saw was that um, was that we all saw almost no change in demand, but we but we saw like obviously a lot more people opting for the free version. And so, so what did I learn with that? I learned that um, wow, there's a lot less price sensitivity on here than I thought there was. And so we like 10x the price, and, and it worked great. And almost all of our growth came from pricing experiments of of, of cranking it up. And our and our metric on there was MRR. So. Um, and, now, and, and actually, Unbounce has, has run a similar test where they found that uh, that churn rate was a lot higher when they had a lower price, but once they cleared to a, a higher price, they, they uh, uh, attracted a different type of user who had a lot lower churn rate. So that higher price actually, you know, churn is such an important part of MRR growth that a higher price actually led to less churn, it's kind of counterintuitive, but hopefully hi, I answered your question, sorry. <laughs> hi, Sean. Yeah? Uh, so um, in your experience, um, what is the accuracy of um, product market fit sessions with online users versus offline users versus a combination? And what is the accuracy of um, your, the responses given in a product demo versus a pro, an actual product user. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's where you start to get into a little bit more of uh, like customer development, lean product development. Um, that a lot of times you're you're at like a demo would be even a prototype. So you you can get directionally useful signal that something looks interesting, but um, I think a, I, I don't think a demo can tell you. If it's a must-have or not, it can it can tell you if it can tell you if if the interest level you you know if you can't get anyone using it that you have your answer that it's not a must-have because your churn rate's 100 percent before they even try it. Um, but so so like you you need to verify that you can actually get people to to want to try it. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean I, so like we're we're in private beta with a product that um, even though we're not really so we've, we've done some sales but like we what we do know is that we have 60 percent retention cohorts after six weeks and even if they're not paying us money the fact that they're still using it gives us gives us that signal but so I, I think you you have to have usage to be able to to be able to, to validate product market fit the offline question i mean that yeah I, I think gym memberships like there, there's a lot of kind of uh customer retention Offline examples that probably um, probably would uh, would give you the same signal. I haven't really applied it in an offline world, but it's uh, you still have a, a growth accounting model, and you know, and, and actually the telecom providers were some of the first to really understand the importance of churn and and um, and you know, cable providers and telecom providers. So so there's definitely you know the the the, the same kind of. Uh, laws of growth <laughs> apply in those areas, but I, I'm not sure like with that question specifically. Like question? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> know who has microphones? Uh, given that you said that growth is hard and that you've run, you have all this backlog that you've groomed after hyper ideation and all that, you get to a certain number of tests. I'm kind of trying to get a feel for the results you see, you know, whether, you know, somewhere around half the tests you run produce some measurable significant growth or whether it's more like 10 or 5% or you know what the failure rate is of tests as far as just not producing? Yeah, so I think that the, um, the, we have a pretty high win rate and that kind of scares me sometimes that we're not, we're not doing radical enough tests. Like you can have a really high win rate with super incremental things, um, but like, you know, one one of our really interesting tests was um, we, instead of putting people directly in our feed, was to have a welcome page that gave them a lot of context about what our product did, and that that doubled the um, the people who were active two weeks later of people who came in that way versus the other way, and so um, that was a pretty radical test. Like, 
and, and counterintuitive. I didn't think it was going to work. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think over time you get smarter about what works and what doesn't work. So that's, that's one thing, but you also have carved out a lot of the low hanging fruit. Like, you know, you're, the, the closer you get to a hundred percent conversion rate at a certain point, like the, the harder it is yeah. to, to move to, to that next level. So, um, you know, but but then then you introduce a new channel, and suddenly there's a whole conversion optimization that needs to happen on a new channel. So, um, I I think it's really it, it's really there, there's there's always room for improvement. It's it's uh, the question is sort of like in in some parts of the business, if you're running tests in some parts of the business where you only have a one in twenty success rate, you're probably you're probably not focused on like the low hanging fruit of the business and that's and that's where that's where having some strategic discussions around you know where where do we really see the opportunity for for improvement and uh and then as you make improvements in one area sometimes that opens up the door for improvements in another area yeah. so it's easy to justify the function anyway the investment in the whole process uh i think it's easier in a growth process versus an optimization process because um because Growth is continuous. Growth, you always need to be growing, but, but I, I've seen a lot of companies sort of introduce a, a, a conversion rate optimization department, and then after a little while it loses steam because of the, of the you know, flattening out of results. Of the yeah, exactly. And, and so, um, so I've encouraged a lot of like, uh, conversion rate optimization agencies and, and experts to, to think of themselves more holistically around growth. Sure. If you're running three or more tests at the same time, how do you choose the tests? Are you kind of deciding you're trying three different hypotheses for increasing activation, let's say, and you compare them separately with different populations? Or do you go after three different tests that improve different of the metrics? How do you choose? So, and yeah, there's, there's a number of factors. Like, one, you don't want tests that conflict with each other. And so sometimes, like, if you're just doing activation tests, they would conflict with each other if you if you did too many, um, but at the same time, like we we in our company tend to have focus areas, and so um, where we as a group think there's there's real opportunity. Like like uh, it, we have uh, AMAs, Ask Me Anything's, where where we had like ten great guests in a row all coming up, like. We, and then we had a whole bunch of experiments that were tagged AMAs. So then our head of growth sort of said, let's, let's have a, a really focused effort on running a bunch of experiments to bring more success around our, our AMAs. And um, so that, like, in, in that case, it was sort of like gearing up for maximizing against a, an opportunity that was going to be a relatively short-term opportunity. Um, so we, we like to have a focus area, but, um, but you have to balance that focus area against, um, against like making sure you're not running conflicting tests. Okay. Uh, uh, you I'm guys here. have a microphone? Here. Sorry, I gotta watch where the right microphone here. is. Guys, guys yeah, right here, right here. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, how do you manage risk on your tests? Meaning, have you ever done tests that have driven customers away? And how do you, how do you, how do you make that, that decision and how do you manage that? Um, yeah, like I, I think uh, you can't, you can't discover better ways unless you're willing willing to risk short term short term drops. And so part of it is by by running it as an A/B test. Um, and you and you don't have to run an A/B test as a 50/50. You can run it as a 10/90. But you just you just want to have like the same same traffic that it's that it's being distributed on. Um, and uh, yeah, so so like I I, I think. Um, I think part of part of the risk is in the discussion about um, like what what could go wrong with this test, and um, and then if it's if it's like disaster that could go wrong, like you know let's let's test turning off all our security. Like maybe that's not a good one, um, but uh, but it's so much faster. Yeah, <laughs> and easier. <laughs> you don't even need a password. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, so I, so I think uh, I think it's you, you do want to kind of worst case scenario it and figure out if it's worth it. But um, but most of the time, most of the time, if you're not willing to if you're, if you're not willing to kind of break things, then then you can't figure out a better way to do things.
So if you don't have a backlog of 700 ideas, do you have like a greatest hits? Like these are five levers, you know, you should always <laughs> check out or uh, something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, interestingly, like that's, that's kind of what, uh, what I, I'm building a sub community right now of, um, of basically what, what will ultimately become public ideas that people can, can try to use that uh, as long as they contribute at least one public idea a week, then they have they have uh, access to the catalog of ideas, and um, so, but not you know not all ideas are transferable between companies. Should I go? Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm not pointing at anybody. You tell me. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. So you talk. I'm sorry. Is it my turn? Yeah, you go. You talked about a landing page. So when it comes to like a welcome page that increased engagement, so when you talk about new content, how do you know it's not the design of that content or the content that's compelling? For example, if another designer had designed it, your engagement wouldn't have gone up. Yeah, so, so I actually think, um, I think it's, it's usually the, the inverse of that that's the problem. How do you know that the test wasn't designed well enough? Because um, if, if it worked because of the design, and that's great. It worked. <laughs> um, but you do want to try to narrow it down that it's, it's the design that worked. Um, so, but I think a lot of times what you're, you know, if somebody's not passionate about the test that they have to design, if they're a designer and they're not passionate about the test, they might kind of, uh, might half-ass it a little bit. And so, um, it, it, you know, it's kind of the same thing as like a MVP on the product side. You, you do want to run somewhat of a minimum viable test, but how do you know if it was too minimum and it was it wasn't designed it was very prototypey and and not good enough and that's why i personally like to try to assign tests to people that are passionate about the test that like our designer gets really excited about certain tests and um if he's working on what if he's responsible for product managing that test then then there's there's or project managing it there, then i know that there's a good chance it's going to really be well executed um and uh, as we add more designers, like that's, you know, the, basically the people you put on it, you want to make sure that they're, they're, they believe in what they're testing or it probably won't work because they're just not going to put enough into it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I wanted to ask you if, if you could follow up a little bit on the answer before. It's like, you know, when you're growing, when you're starting to grow, um, to what percentage of your traffic or of your accounts you actually be running the tests? Because 50 50 is pretty risky. Mm -hmm. So, you know, based on your experience or your expertise, what do, what do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, if you're, um, I think it kind of depends on your traffic level. So if, uh, if, you, if you're going to run, say, 20% in the test against 80% as your, as your control and the best thing that you know, and that it's going to take three weeks to get a statistically significant sample size, you're still exposing the same number of people to it. So, um, like you might as well get the answer in a week and go 50, 50. Um, but if you're, if you're Facebook and you're running a test and you could get the answer in like three minutes, then, um, yeah, then, then you probably want to do it on a little tiny amount of traffic so that you can run it over the right number of days. No, I'm, I'm talking about the beginning though. So not the Facebook. <laughs> yeah. In the beginning, I, I, I would, I would basically say, what are you protecting in the beginning? Like, you have a crappy business in the beginning. We all do. Like that's, <laughs> there's not a whole lot to lose. And, and I've seen people get really protective about that little, little part in the beginning. And that's, for me, it's been great. Like that, that test where I said, we're going to make the free version. Um, we're gonna make a really good free version on this, on this uh, product that we acquired. My, and I said, but we, we really might screw up our, our, uh, our MRR on the, on the business, and my investor said, if it goes to zero, it's really not big, a big deal. It's just not that much yet. So, um, so like if, if people are all on the same page, then that's then that's good. Thank you. You wanna you wanna keep going, or are you good? Should we cut it there? Uh, I got to, let's do two more. Two more. All right. We're growing. We're growing. <laughs> Um, so for a really early stage product, what's a good way to do some of the uh, market product testing if you don't have like, you know, data points or like a, a community? Yeah, I, mean, I think in an early stage product, you're um, like, like so, so the product that, that we have in private beta is, is saying like, I, I, we're not running tests. 
like all we're we're literally we're building a backlog of tests that we eventually want to run but we're much more in that customer development mode where we get we get 15 20 pieces of feedback a day coming in and we are having phone calls with as many people as we can have you know i sat between two users last night at dinner and just got peppered with wish lists and gripes and um, you know, asking people for brutally honest feedback. But so that's one thing, but I'll tell you the other thing that I'm doing is I'm purposely adding as much friction as I possibly can to letting people in in the first place. So what I'm doing is that if they, if they don't want it enough to jump through four hoops, they're not even gonna use it. So by the time they're giving me feedback, they work to get in there. So they, they've, they've kind of self-qualified. So I basically, it's a sign up for a waiting list they have to fill out a survey. Then, then I pick from the survey who I think is qualified. Then I say that they need to uh, send me their account information, which a lot of people then won't, won't respond to that. And then I send them a, uh, a, an invite plus a demo video, and I don't offer any help onboarding. And so... <laughs> Yeah, and between, between all of that, like, the, so it helps having, that's how we have 60% retention cohorts is because those people who got in there, they fought to get in there. But at the same time, by the time I'm getting feedback from those people, I'm getting really good feedback. It's not somebody like, I would love you if you did this. Like, it's, it's, it's people who are like, I need you now, and can you please do this because it's killing me. So that's the playing hard to get strategy. Yeah. Okay, cool. Last question? Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question on early growth hacking. So if you're just starting out with a product, what's, what's the best early generic channels to grow your product? So the first place that I would start for most products is, is figure out is there, is there existing demand that's, that's out there? Like is it, um, and for some products there won't be. Like with, uh, with Log Me In, there was when we launched it because go to my PC was already in market spending hundreds of millions of dollars creating demand and we we had a disruptive business model where we had you know same thing but free so we could sell aggressively into that demand and basically just harvest all of that intent when i worked with zobni i thought oh i'm going to use the same playbook this is great and then nobody was looking for some thing that plugs onto your email that helps you sort through crap or whatever the, whatever the value proposition so those are not actually there. channels uh i was i meant like so with log me in did you like uh buy google ads against them whenever people yeah search, so that's what i'm saying like words. if the intent's there then yeah then then you basically you have to figure out how do i tap into that intent if that means buying the ads if that means seo if that means you know if they're looking at directories how is it, if the intent's there, how is it that they go out and try to find a product like yours? And you make sure that you're in every place where they are, and that's usually kind of the lowest hanging fruit for, for that product. Um, for Dropbox, it was, uh, for Dropbox, it, it pretty quickly, there was, there was a lot of uh, word of mouth and other things that were happening around it. And so for Dropbox, it was, it was basically, it was about just like figuring out and doubling down and, and cutting friction was the best way we could grow that product. And knowing that we, we had like four different, four different uh, use cases that people were onboarding into and, and knowing that if we tried to push the full package on them, that we were gonna confuse the heck out of them. All the things you can do with this. So we had to make sure that if they were coming through a file share, that we positioned it as a file share product until they got all the way through, fully registered, and then, and then figured out what's that next use case that we can introduce them to. What's the next use case until eventually they have the full view on the product. So it really depends product by product, but there was not a lot of search intent for Dropbox, but there was a I lot of Hacker growth News opportunities. Hacker News is probably the best early driver for Dropbox, right? What's that? Hacker News is the best early driver for Dropbox in that like there's a lot of early adopters in Hacker News and they kind of like- Yeah, Dig, Dig was so actually the, yeah, video and Dig was like, got, got the ball rolling. But um, so what I can tell you is that um, I, there was one question that I asked at Dropbox, which was, uh, which best describes you? I like to be among the first to try cool new technology or I only try things that will be useful for me. I asked that question the day we did the public launch and, um, 
of, of the users, and it was 80% of the people saying that uh, I like to be among the first to try cool new technology. Six months later, it was reversed. It was 80% of people saying I only try things that will be useful for me. Um, and like, so, so, so yeah, I mean, when you say the beginning, I don't know, like this is day one, day 66, you know, it's kind of, it changes pretty quickly on, on some products. All right, great. Well, thanks a lot, John. Let's give Sean a big round of applause. Awesome talk. <laughs>